Good morning and welcome to King's where we are going to encounter Jesus today. Welcome to all those who are joining us online and our children. You're so welcome and they're going to play for us musical instruments and they're going to join in today, aren't they? Singing? Yeah. Um, just a quick admin matter. If, you need, if there's a fire, somebody will shout, fire, fire, and a bell will go off. Um, either out of this door here or out of the back and through the side and we congregate at the bottom left corner of the car park. Hopefully that won't happen, but um, as Steve said last week, just follow me. <laughs> um, so the weekly notices, let's just get those. Um, first of all, just a, a, a thanks to Michelle. She's not here today. She's not feeling very well. Um, we've got... Um, Thank you all for the faithful giving so far this year. The budget at the start of the year was a large deficit. And although we're not there yet, the giving has increased significantly and reduced the deficit. So thank you and thank you, Lord. Um, so notices for the week. Scott's preaching in Nutsford this morning. Um, tonight, 7.30 on a Zoom call, uh, a Nutsford mission meeting. Monday, 9.15, Tiddler's Meet. Wednesday, 2 p.m., Bible Study. Thursday, 10 a.m., Prayer Meeting. That's Prayer for the Nations. Um, and then going on um, for, for the future, Welsh Revival Lecture, Sunday the 1st of October at 10 o'clock. Harvest Festival will be here on Sunday the 9th. Medcare Christmas Fair on the 10th, and I think that's in Frodsham. Yeah, yeah. So um, you can get your Christmas shopping done early and support Medcare. And our church weekend away is the 11th, Friday the 11th till Sunday the 13th. There are forms at the back. Um, if you want to speak to Tabitha about it, she'll be around later on. On the 23rd of November, David Block who is a Christian astronomer, will be speaking here. Um, so think about who you could invite to that. Who's not a Christian, um, not walking with the Lord, who it might just float their boat. Um, and our nat Nativity Festival will be the 10th and the 11th of December. So various uh, things for you to remember. Um, I'm going to hand over to David, because David's got... Um, some announcements he wants us to make. Thank you, Rainy. It's David and Eve. We never go anywhere separately, do we? No. Unless it's birding. Unless it's birding, yeah. She goes off and I do something interesting. Stop wasting your time. Sorry, sorry, I haven't got much time. I must go. The reason we stood here this morning is that uh, our church is looking at additional ways to minister to older adults. And even I've been asked to do some initial work on that. We've got a leaflet which outlines some of the current thinking that we're working on. And I'll be at the back at the end. So pick up one of these off me if you're interested in just finding out more or being part of what the church is going to do in the future. I've used the term older adults because I wanted to find a really respectful term to describe this group within our church family and in society generally, because some people take offense at certain phrases, and that's the last thing we want to do. So I did some research, and apparently the current thinking seems to be older, older adults is the most respectful phrase, but seniors is okay as well. So that's a phrase I'm going to use. But whatever name, we all know what we're talking about. It's those precious members of our church family and our community in the later phase of this life, and you've got two of them stood in front of you this morning. Thank you, sir. She's older than she looks. Anyway, the, uh, I'm in trouble now, aren't I? The vision can be encapsulated in the phrase, to enable older, ad older adults to finish well. And the philosophy that we're promoting uh, can be encapsulated in a quote from a lady called Louise Morse. Now, she's a Christian counselor and cognitive behavioral therapist who also works in the area of dementia. And on her website, she says this, and I let Eve read that to you. 
In my talks, I often quote Ephesians 2.10. It's a foundational scripture that explains so much of our lives. I like the version from the complete Jewish Bible that says, For we are God's making, created in union with the Messiah, Jeju. 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 All right. For a life of good actions, already prepared by God for us to do. Another version says that we are God's masterpiece. And I'm struck by the two important things. First, that having planned these good works, God has led us to them. So we don't have to look for them. And second, it's not, we have no use by date. In this verse, it applies as much to the later years as to any other time. And it's interesting, I think, that many street pastors and school pastors are in their later years. I think the oldest one just retired at 94. And probably, even I work with Open the Book, the majority of folks engaged in Open the Book are in their later years. Older adults make a valuable contribution in many other areas of ministry as well, and some of which are demanding or complex. So that's our vision. Clearly, as we age, though, many of us do suffer constraints in physical and mental abilities, and many of them are serious. And the church's ministry must encompass that providing support, fellowship, and safeguarding where that's needed. But in its totality, ministry for older adults is much more than that. I believe, or we believe, we should be ambitious for our older adults and for the church generally. So we've, we've come up with two aims, and we're suggesting that these might well be the aims for the church. Firstly, to see non-Christian older, or older adults encounter Jesus, which is an obvious one, isn't it? Because that's what we exist for anyway. So many of them, though, don't know Jesus. They don't know how passionately Jesus loves them. And we seek to change that as the Church of Jesus Christ. The second one will be to see Christian older adults fulfill their discipleship potential. And so a foundational principle that we're suggesting is that older adults are facilitated to fully engage as they're able in all church activities. And so their needs must always be taken into account. But we also ensure that the specific needs of this group within our church family are met with some particular activities really designed especially for them, including maybe re-establishing some of the great work we know has gone on here in this church in the past before COVID put an end to some of it. But there's maybe other things we can think about developing as well. So we're going to just uh, suggest some examples, but please bear in mind these are only examples. We're not suggesting these are the things we should focus on or the things we should do. We're stimulating thinking and getting, hopefully, us motivated to, to further developments in this area. So, so here are some of the suggestions we've come up with, and you may well have more, and we want to hear them at some point. Sunday afternoon or midweek services were about 35 minutes with a short preaching slot and traditional hymns, followed by a cream tea. Maybe some fellowship activity groups perhaps historical or reminiscent interest talks or other kinds of talks as well. Uh, a system for providing lifts for those who, without transport. I know everyone does ad hoc at the moment, but maybe a bit more formally. Yeah, it'd be nice if people who needed a lift didn't have to ask, can anyone give me a lift? But there was a system that already had anticipated that they need a lift. Uh, concerts or other entertainment events. A formalised home visiting programme to those who find it difficult for physical or emotional reasons to get out. A pastoral buddying system to ensure monitoring and support of those who are vulnerable or likely to become so. Worship service in care homes. Christmas, Easter and New Year events appropriate for older adults. And the example I always think about here is when you get older, you don't want to stay up to midnight to celebrate New Year. So let's get together in church and have a nice get-together, oh, nice, sorry, ha have a meaningful get-together of some kind, and we celebrate New Year at 8 o'clock, and then we go off to bed. How's that? I like that. <laughs> um, Bible study material designed for the older adults in mind. And possibly something even I already involved with, a weekly cafe for those living with dementia and their carers. The field is vast, and the potential is exciting. It really is. And God is a God that provides. So what do we do now? Well, we're just suggesting this to start discussion and stimulation. We need to pray, obviously, and we need to seek God's will. It's no point us starting out on a journey that, God, that it doesn't reflect where God's going with us. But then 
could I ask each of you to prayerfully think about, is that something you'd like to get involved with? Any of the things we suggested or whatever? Even I am happy to lead on these things, but obviously things only happen if there are workers to pray to come forward. And I would say, you know, don't just say, I'll do it because I'm feeling guilty or I'm doing it because I think I should. Pray about it. And if you feel it's something that God's asking you to, to be part of, then that's always the best reason, I think, to get involved in anything in the church. So when we get some feedback, we'll evaluate where we are, we'll report back to the leadership team, and then uh, the leadership team will decide as a church where we might go with this. That's it. Thank you very much. you for this precious day. We thank you, Lord, for times of fellowship with one another. But we thank you, Lord, for times of fellowship with you. Lord, we pray you'll bless the work here at King's, and I pray for uh, what Eve and David have spoken about, Lord, that you would show us as a, as a body what we, we should do for our senior members and, and those around us, Lord, that may be lonely and, and, and need support. But most of all, Lord, they need you. So Holy Spirit, we ask you just to take your rightful place and to, for your will to be done in this service this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you like to stand? This morning, whoa, it's a bit loud. This morning, when, um, when, when we bring our offering of worship to, to the Lord, let's, let's focus on who He is and what He means to us individually. The first song is, is Christ Alone. It's the corner, you know, He's the cornerstone of our lives. He's, he's the building block that holds it all together. Without Him in our lives, life would be very challenging and disrupted. Let's sing, let's sing this morning. Amen. Thank you. 
ultimately in control of it and that when we hang our hat on the, on the words in your scriptures we, we get the answers to all Amen, Amen
times of trouble and in the good times our hope is in you Lord Jesus Amen Amen Let us pray Heavenly Father we give thanks for all that you do for us your children you walk with us daily and help us on our way Lord, we ask you to look after the Russian people, mostly the men of fighting age who have been stopped from leaving the country and are being forced to fight against Ukraine. The vast majority of these do not want to fight their neighbor, but they have no choice. There are huge numbers of people fleeing Russia. We must keep them all in our prayers, especially those that are forced to stay behind. If you could perform a miracle, Lord, please let it be that Putin sees the error of his ways and that Satan's hold on him is broken. We pray also, Lord, for those people who are at the borders to help all those fleeing to safety and those people involved in delivering aid to all war-torn countries. Pray especially for the children who are the innocent in all of this. We also offer up prayers, Lord, for our government while they cope with fuel and cost of living crises and that any future decisions will benefit all of the population, not just the few. We pray against a bad wave of autumn COVID that is threatening this country which, if everyone is to be believed, could be worse than the last one. So we pray against this, Lord, and that anyone that catches COVID will not suffer too badly. And last of all, Lord, let us give thanks for the work that is being done in Uganda by Medcare, as it cares for the children who desperately need that help just to survive. invite the Holy Spirit into this presence, into this place, into our presence. Father God, in King's Church this morning, we declare that you are King. We declare that we need you, Lord Jesus. We, we need your Holy Spirit in and amongst us so that we can be effective for your kingdom here on earth. We prepare to listen to the word that you have to bring through Rainy Lord. Help us to understand. Holy Spirit, come and help us understand. Use this time also, each of us. Let's use this time to bring to the Lord anything that, that we want to petition him with, anything that we need prayer for, anything that we want to present before him and declare to him, Lord Jesus, I need your Holy Spirit. I need you to help in this situation. Nothing worth more that 
taste it and see of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for, to be overwhelmed by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more. Of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come flood this place and Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overwhelmed by your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the eye. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overwhelmed by your presence, Lord. Let us become far away. Your presence, let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. blessed to have such a wonderful worship group. Thanks, guys. 
Uh, The title of the sermon this morning is Who is in your boat? And hopefully as we get to the end of the sermon you'll realise what I'm talking about. The NHS describes anxiety as a feeling of unease such as worry or fear that can be mild or severe. Everyone has feelings of anxiety at some point in their life. We've seen, following the death of the Queen, emotion from people all over the world, various reactions, and it begs the question, was this event an opening or outlet for people's underlying fears and concerns? I don't know about you, but as I've got older, I have become more anxious. TV tells us that over 50% of young people suffer from anxiety. So is it becoming an epidemic? As I prayed about my anxiety, and I also had prayer for it, I started to examine what it is and where does it come from. The world would tell me my anxiety is because of family loss or having been treated for cancer, possibly the effects of the drugs I'm taking, maybe the after effects of COVID, etc., etc., I did try medication for five days and I ended up in a and e because it wasn't working for me. I tried counselling and that had a positive impact, helping me relate to things in my past and things deeply buried. You could say the way I have been programmed throughout my life. My anxiety brought on fear and the impact that has is to immobilise to remove sense of reason, to want to run but not know where to go, and to feel their heart racing in my chest, and to lose all ability to think straight. Then the fear of it happening again would create an anticipated fear, and so the circle got bigger and bigger. I learned to use tactics that would help me avoid situations, but this was not always possible and I would anticipate the way my body was going to react. But the more I questioned, and the more I tried to deal with it, I realised that as a Christian, I needed to understand where this anxiety was coming from, and why it impacts my life as it does. Please don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying medication and counselling is wrong. It can be and is helpful. But I needed to understand this from a spiritual point of view. Some weeks ago, the sermon was about the disciples in the boat with Jesus. He was asleep, and there was a most dreadful storm, and the disciples were in fear of their lives. And I guess as experienced fishermen, they must have been re- it must have been really bad, as they would have experienced storms often. So why was this so different? And why was Jesus asleep at a time that there was so much, so his his friends were so anxious and afraid? If we look at Jesus' response after being woken up by his terrified friends, Mark 5 verses 39 and 40 tells us, he got up, rebuked the wind and the waves, quiet, Be still, he said. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And so he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Notice he doesn't start bailing the boat out. He doesn't stand up there shouting instructions as to what to do. He deals with the storm. He brings about a calm and a peace. Then he asks, why are you so afraid? The connection he makes is between fear and faith. Did they miss out on something by not moving in faith? After all, hadn't they seen all the amazing miracles Jesus had performed? Yes, I think sometimes when we don't step out in faith, we miss out on something. But at the same time, when we do move in faith and we receive the results, we learn so much more about God. 
This story made me ask myself the question, is Jesus in my boat or am I sailing alone? Or is Jesus in my boat and maybe he's asleep? So if he's not panicking and seeing the worst thing that could happen, lying awake at night worrying about what might never happen, why am I doing those things? 2 Timothy 1.7 said, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. So as I looked at that verse and prayed about it, I realized that I was actually entering into spiritual realms that can and do impact me. Fear is the opposite of faith. It is corrosive in its effects, even deadly. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. These principles are the great antidotes to the fears that rob us of our strength and sometimes knock us down to defeat. So if God didn't give me the spirit of fear, then who did? And the impact of that spirit of fear is no power. It impacts love because you can't focus on anyone else other than yourself. And it impacts your mind. You can't think clearly or sometimes you can't think at all. The answer was so very plain. Satan uses fear. What an amazing weapon he has if we allow it to be used against us. What a weapon that can be used against every individual on this planet. TV, media, and social media bombards us with bad news every day. Every phone call, email, and text you receive could be a possible scam. We hear about murders and knife attacks randomly happening to school children and people in the street. We are being told our planet is dying. Pictures of starving children, homes destroyed through fire and flood, crops devastated, cost of living crisis, countries going into recession, and lots, lots more. We do not see the good news of Jesus the miracles that are happening across the world, the hope that can, can be found in our Lord. Why, <clears throat> when the news shows snippets of the Queen's funeral, did they not show the parts concerning her faith in Jesus, or the sermon preached, or the hymns exalting God? Anxiety leading to fear is spreading through our world, just like COVID has. But we don't need a vaccine we need Jesus. Well, I have Jesus, so what do I need to do? Our spirit is the part of us that connects with God. Fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous and likely to cause pain or a threat. When your spirit is clogged or dominated by fear, your connection to God is affected. So I looked at how people in the Bible dealed with various circumstances. Look at Mary, the mother of Jesus, when she's told by an angel that she's going to have a child. A very young girl, a virgin, betrothed to Joseph, it was a death sentence. Did she say, no thanks, or what am I going to get in return? No, Luke tells us she said, I am the Lord's servant. May your words be fulfilled. Mary had faith and trusted God. Joseph is told that Mary will have a child and he's not the father. So he decided to divorce her quietly. But through a dream, an angel confirms that he should not be afraid to take Mary as his wife. So he does. And through another dream, he is told by an angel to escape to Egypt. So he does. His fear is driven out by faith and trust in God, which causes him to react and save Jesus, the baby. Paul, whilst in prison, sang, sang hymns of praise. So how did Jesus handle stress and anxiety? For let us not forget he was a man as well as being God. 
We know he would take himself off to fast and pray. We know he read the word of God. He discussed it. He pondered over it, took it into his heart. He memorized it and he used it as a weapon against Satan. We know he asked his disciples to watch and pray. And we know he walked in faith. I've sometimes had people say to me, yeah, but Jesus was God. So he didn't have to go through what I'm going through. But think of this. Jesus knows what it's like to have a non-biological parent. He knows what it's like to be adopted. He knows what it's like to be in a family with half-brothers and sisters. He knows what it's like to see the fear in his parents and have to escape to another country and a language that is unfamiliar. He knows what it's like not to have a home. He knows what it's like to lose a father. He knows what it's like to become responsible for his mother and siblings. He knows what it's like to be bullied and ridiculed. He knows what it's like to be rejected and betrayed. He knows what it's like to be hated and falsely accused. He knows what it's like to be laughed at. He knows what it's like to engage in church politics. He knows the impact of false teachings. He knows what it's like to be single and childless. He knows what it's like to be alone. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to be told he's going to die. And he knows the pain of death. He knows exactly what I'm going through. He also knew what it's like to be separated from God because of my sin and your sin. Something I don't have to go through because of his work on the cross. Jesus himself warned us that in this world we would suffer tribulations and trials. But he also urged us to remember he has overcome the world. 1 John 4 says, For greater is he, Jesus, that is in us than he that is in the world. We all need power in our lives. But true strength does not come from relying on your own capabilities, but on Christ. Christ, who has promised that his grace is sufficient for all, for all the difficulties and dangers of life that we face. For his strength is made perfect in our weakness. For when we are weak in our own abilities, then we become strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We all need love in our lives, but true godly love is not something we struggle to produce through our own flesh fleshly efforts, but can only be produced in us as spiritual fruit as we abide in Christ and he abides in us. We all need sound judgment and a disciplined mind, but we can't achieve this by self-effort and fleshly struggling, nor can it be developed through extra-biblical training programs or webinars. But as we look to Jesus and willingly submit to the ongoing child training and correction work of the Holy Spirit within, we will experience an inexplicable inner peace that passes all understanding. For this is the promises of God to all whose mind is resting in Christ. How does the word of God empower me and you to face life's fears and anxieties? In the Bible, God has given us numerous promises we can claim or hold on to during seasons of doubt and fear. We are reminded that he knows our hearts, that we are prone to worry, fear and anxiety. This is why he speaks to our fears and encourages us to surrender them. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, With thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. 
John 14, 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Let us remember as a family, we have the responsibility and the privilege to pray for one another and the power of those prayers result in victory. We need to pray against fear in the world. And when the doors of heaven will open and the battle will be won, then people will turn to God. Will I have anxious moments and times of fear? Yes, I will. But I know who's in my boat. And if my faith is lacking, he will calm the storm and then he'll teach me more about faith in him. So is Jesus in your boat? Don't leave today unless you leave in the power of God, with the love of God, and the mind of God. Thank you. Amen. Would you like to stand? Thank you, Rainy, for that. That's a uh, nice, nice, easy thing to remember. <clears throat> Who's in your boat? Sometimes we say we need a bigger boat. Sometimes when the boat gets too big, we don't know what to do with all the stuff in it. That's my garage normally. But <laughs> too much stuff around us. But sometimes that stuff around us clutters our thinking and we forget what's important. And that's, that's, that's it. Who's in your boat? So when, when things get difficult and we don't know what to do with all the things around us, let's focus on Jesus. So we've got, we've got to, let's sing. Um, Waiting Here for You is a song by Martin Smith. It's all about if faith can move the mountains, let the mountains move. And it's about just telling, you know, waiting here for, God, for God's power and God's presence and um, remembering that he is God, that he, if, if God is in our boat, if God is walking with us, what, what can't we achieve in our lives for him, right? Let's sing. Thank you, Jesus.
waiting here for you with our hands lifted high in praise and it's you As we wait for you, we know, Lord Jesus, that you're able to do far more than we can ever imagine. So, Lord, as we, as we go out and we declare that you are able, be with us this week, Lord Jesus. Amen.
praise to life our God is able in his name we overcome for a love our God is able lift it up and he did the grave praise to life our God is able in his name we overcome for the Lord our God is able for the Lord our God is able for the Lord our God is able Amen After the service there are two points to connect with over on my left here Alwyn and Moira and myself will be available for anybody who wants to chat or wants some prayer um, and in the foyer Terry will be available to tell you things that are going on within the church we don't have an offering plate that goes round but there is um, a place out there where you can use your card technology um, and a box if you want to put money in um, to, to give so it's been my pleasure to share what I felt God has been telling me over the last few weeks. So let's uh, join hands and, and say the grace to one another. Can we join? Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Coffee in the foyer for those that want it. Prayer at the front for those that want that. <laughs>